Hi, um, so today we'll be talking about student-centered course design and we'll introduce ourselves shortly. Hi, I'm Sophia. Um, I am currently in the graduating class of 2020. Um, I'm originally from Victoria, BC, but I now live in North Hatley, Quebec. Hello, my name is Jenna. I'm a third year marketing student and I'm from Naples, Florida. Hi, I'm André. I'm a second year double majoring in Film and International Studies, and I'm from Surrey, British Columbia. Hi, I'm Amanda Siro. I'm an elementary education student with a minor in TESOL, and I'm from the South Shore of Montreal in Quebec. Um, hi, I'm Salma. I am studying biology going into my third year, um, and I'm from Algeria. So what is our program and the process we go through? So the Online Learning and Technology Consultants Program is basically one that is comprised of 22 students um, across all disciplines from Bishop's University. So we have people from natural sciences, humanities, business, education, um, and social sciences. So um, what we do is we focus really on um, aiding professors and using the student voice in order to do that, um, to help design their courses online due to the global pandemic and all of that, we can have no choice to shift everything to an online setting. So we really focus on pedagogy and um, we were trained for two weeks more intensively in order to do this and help professors. Um, our focus is really on empathetic design. So how can we help um, design and transfer a course online while taking into account both the student experience and preserving the professor's teaching values and course objectives? So that, that was really um, our main goal going in. So like I said, after these two weeks of intensive training um, regarding online course delivery, and this training is still ongoing, like I can probably speak for all of us and say that we um, are training ourselves a lot um, during the process and learning a lot about new platforms and how they can be better used, like their pros and cons and all of that. Um, so with these technological platforms, we began working with these faculty members on their courses. Um, it soon became clear that many of them were facing a lot of discomfort and a lot of anxiety um, around like surrounding the technological aspect and student engagement aspect of online learning. So ultimately, um, our goal is really to engage in partnership with the professor in order to establish this collaborative work environment that is aligned with their teaching values and their course objectives. So we emphasize that this is a safe space and a brave space that we can create through like dialogue with them and collective effort. Um, it's really a partnership, students as partners. So we really work in partnership with the professor. There's not one that's higher up than the other. It's really a collaborative process. And we really make it a point that all information and conversations with um, faculty remains confidential between ourselves and the program. So what is the process of this? Um, so we ask professors to register for our program through our website. Um, and then once they do that, they're directed to this pre-assessment questionnaire that they fill out. It only takes a few minutes. This questionnaire kind of asks them to rate themselves on multiple Likert scales. And this allows us to get a better understanding of their needs um, before we meet through them on Microsoft Teams, which is a platform Bishops is prioritizing this year. Um, so we first start with an initial needs assessment. Um, this typically lasts in one hour, and this is where we meet with the professor, we go over the course syllabus and ask a variety of questions regarding the expectations, course information, and technolo technological proficiency. So during this time, any and all questions and concerns are taken into account and noted. Um, after that, uh, we go off and we um, discuss as a group, what do we think would be the most important things to note and recommend to the professor moving forward? So this is where there's a second needs assessment that comes into play, and this is the recommendations. So um, based on those notes that we took the first um, meeting, we offer recommendations to professors. We begin with something called the top 10 low hanging fruit, like the 10 quick and easy high impact things we can implement off the get go. And these include things like kind of having um, things on Moodle, like uh, professor info, photos, office hour schedulers, um, migrating resources from the old course page to the newer one because Bishops recently switched um, up and updated their Moodle page, which is a platform we use. Um, have type of collapsible topics just to ensure kind of a cleaner page and layout. Um, have pre-course questionnaires to get to know students because the student is, experience is really prioritized at Bishops. And also, um, icebreaker activities and um, things that they can implement in their course off the get-go. 
Um, when we move, then we move over on to what we call a premium package, where we kind of focus on the recommendations centered around student engagement. And this really involves features that encourages students to engage in the course and take kind of accountability for their own learning. It, it kind of allows them to do that more easily. Um, then we move on to specific recommendations, recommendations which are more platform specific, and this enhances the learning environment. So that's the goal of these more specific recommendations. We recommend platforms such as Perusal, which is um, uh, just an example. Perusal is one where uh, teachers can put the ra um, readings, videos, and a lot of things, and all the students can work collaboratively, have kind of discussion threads within the reading, and it can kind of help give different perspectives um, on the reading itself, and uh, voice any maybe questions or comments. And uh, we use a lot of other platforms for enhancement as well. And then lastly, we move on to something that's called our kind of blue sky stretch goal. And we believe that this recommendation should showcase the professor's wildest dreams, something that they would really like to do in an online setting, but that they're not sure how they can go about. And usually this involves kind of semester long projects and rethinking forms of assessment. So although this seems very structured, we kind of make sure the conversation flows organically. And we often take the time to talk about questions and concerns other than this needs assessment and the recommendations. We really pride ourselves on building this strong professional relationship with these professors, and it's really based on vulnerability, trust, and honesty. And this whole process has really been rewarding um, thus far. Okay, so although the program is mainly focused on um, us helping professors, we also take into consideration the worries of the students as well. So these are four topics that students may be worried about, and we're also going to give recommendations for how to alleviate these worries. So regarding lack of personal motivation, um, personally, the dramatic shift to the online semester was initially frustrating and confusing. Um, but this uncertainty led me and many other students to feel unmotivated for the remainder of the semester. So although we are definitely more prepared for this upcoming semester, students will now be dealing with at-home distractions, um, flexible schedules, and this will all increase procrastination. So as a student, my best advice to other students would be getting a calendar, a planner, which personally helps me tremendously, um, also, just getting dressed in the morning, even if you're only walking five feet from your bed to your desk, um, it just, it personally makes me so much more motivated. Um, so little habits like these will make it easier for students to be productive and motivated, but also professors can play a part in student motivation. So providing the resources and advice for students um, to promote better habits will be essential in how motivated they'll be throughout the semester. So um, as a recommendation, professors can recommend to their students working at their desk versus working from their bed, um, which will help keep their attention better. Also, keeping their grades up to date um, on Moodle is a big one, especially for me, because I have been in classes where I don't get a grade until my final grade. So just even seeing um, that the work I'm doing is being graded uh, will um, keep that motivation for completing other assignments. And then lastly, even just personally reaching out to a student and saying, hey, you're doing a great job will be um, motivating as well. So I'm going to pass it to Andre to talk about quality of education. All right, thanks, Jenna. So one worry that we've seen, I've personally seen many times from friends of mine or just uh, on different uh, social media platforms is that Students are worried that they're paying for a lesser education, that in the fall semester going online, it's not gonna be the same experience as in person and they'll, uh, they'll have a worse experience because of it. Yes, it will be very different from the online classroom, but the, rec the way that I'm gonna kind of discuss this right now is not only for the students and how they should alleviate it, but also how the faculty, professors, whoever can also help the students get over this uh, thought process. So what we should try to consider the coming semester with the online education is that it is no longer a COVID-19 response. And we should try to put the mindset that we are normalizing online education. And with the time that we had this summer, we are attempting to render it 
more dynamic and comprehensive through all the different tools that we've been using, whether it's all the activities and resources on Moodle, the use of Microsoft Teams, BlueJeans, Zoom, and knowing properly how those function, and then Microsoft 365, all of the different, different tools that we can use there. We're, we're trying to create a very, very dynamic and comprehensive space that allows for new ways to deliver content, new ways to assess students and create projects, create assignments, that we have all this abundance of opportunities that we haven't had the, hadn't had the need to really focus on just yet. So yes, the feeling of the classroom won't be fully replicated, but taking into account what will be discussed today and also the past experience that we've already had with the winter semester and the spring and summer semesters as faculty or students, we have to put on the mindset that it's not done to that what we will be doing in the fall is not done to accommodate the pandemic and doing having that mindset we can then avoid the chaos and uncertainty that occurred in march at the lockdown period and create a space that encourages online learning in a dynamic way for the future so now we'll talk about a second wave and that will be for amanda um, so when it comes to student worries, um, the idea of a second wave, there's a lot of anxiety surrounding this. And at this point, it's kind of a question of if there will be a second wave and also when there will be a second wave. Um, so a lot of people are coming back to school and a lot are coming back to campus and all that. Even though things are online, some people have no choice to uh, kind of actually be in the setting because that helps a lot with the whole idea of motivation and just being really in, in the zone of, of learning and all of that. Um, but that also means that you see your friends and everything. And um, I, we've heard of some instances where some schools have already kind of locked down and closed off completely because people were partying and things are kind of getting out of hand and a lot of new cases um, started emerging. Um, so in this case, a lot of us are kind of preparing for the worst in this situation. And I think this brings a lot of anxiety surrounding kind of um, what this means for education as a whole. What does this mean for job opportunities um, for the graduating class? Um, how does this work for uh, internships and like the ability to graduate? I know for myself, I'm going into um, my final internship in an elementary school. And um, what happens if everything decides to log down again? What, what goes on then? Um, I think what we can suggest in this case, it's really kind of focus on the present and don't be afraid to voice these concerns. Um, by being responsible, we can definitely help prevent um, this and like by following the guidelines, but it's also something that is reliant on others being responsible as well. And that's not necessarily always under our control. So we can't determine whether or not there will be another lockdown. Um, we can focus only on respecting the guidelines on our own end and taking things day by day and just being mindful that whatever happens, there will be a solution um, for and all situations that may arise in this case. And now I'm going to hand it off for a uh, lack of community. Yeah, um, so one of the major concern that we found is lack of, lack of community going into fall 2020. Um, so being conscious of that in your course design is crucial to help to help students' um, well-being. So creating an engaging and safe environment where students can have the opportunity to create bonds is important. And um, we will touch on building community throughout this presentation. Um, but a couple examples to combat that is using breakout rooms and synchronous sessions, um, asynchronous discussion forums, and group-based mm -hmm. projects. And also, once students know how to use this technology, um, like Teams and channels, mm -hmm. then they will have the abilities mm -hmm. to um, have live sessions with their friends that are, and family. So um, we can still build a community online while still being safe. Mm -hmm. And now we will move on to, I think, business, um, business experience. Yes, so as Amanda mentioned, we are divided by division. So I would like to start by sharing my experience as a business student. Um, I quickly came to realize that most of my business courses are content-based with a mixture of experiential learning. 
And by experiential learning, I mean students are taught through guest speakers, networking events, mock interviews, etc. So with this being said, I want to share my top three tips with how to make this model successful. And um, these tips aren't only uh, necessarily directed at business, they could definitely work in other divisions as well. So my top tip is to centralize content. So as I mentioned, a lot of these courses are material based. And um, there are a lot of platforms that are being recommended and um, that are circling through the online environment. So, um, for example, uh, BU um, specializes with Moodle, which is a kind of a content bank. So there will be a lot of files, PowerPoints, drop boxes. So if we can centralize all of that content in one place, it will be less stressful than um, giving students links to three different websites or um, having them or having them email assignments, but also meeting here, uh, sending something there. It just really uh, focuses and um, lessens the stress on the student. So this is the same um, goes the same for Gradebook and Dropboxes as well that I mentioned. So for Gradebook, um, if you have your gradebook set up on a website such as Moodle, it is easy for a student to access all their grades at once. So for example, I've been in courses where professors would have me email them an assignment and they would send me my grade through email, but they would also like um, grade separate assignments on Moodle. And as a student, this was um, it was very confusing and hard to keep track of assignments and et cetera. So I wanna move on to tip number two, which is don't give up on interactive features. So this goes more with the experiential learning that I talked about. When I worked with business professors, uh, the first thing they said, and they sound very disappointed, is, oh, well, I can't have guest speakers anymore. They can't come in. Or I can't have students work in interactive group projects because they can't meet in person. But if anything, now more than ever, it is easier to work together, it is easier to host guest speakers because there are features on Teams that allows professors to come in as guests and speak or your guest speakers to come in and speak as guests. And as well as things like networking events, virtual events are becoming the norm nowadays. So now is the perfect opportunity to set up a virtual mock interview or a virtual networking event within your classroom. And so the last tip I have, tip three, is uh, considering alternative assessments within the classroom. So at, like as a business student, I have taken business courses and it has the broad opportunity to do um, pro final projects, final presentations, um, final group work. But now that we're moving online, I've seen a lot of professors just default to using multiple choice exams as um, an option because that's what they think their only option is. However, um, we can still consider alternative assessments. So although multiple choice is a great way of uh, testing course material learned, um, there's also been like a note or just kind of questioning on academic integrity, but Moodle has many features that alleviate this worry. But there are still opportunities to do DBAs, which are discussion based assessments, where you speak with your student over uh, teams or over the phone and discuss course material rather than doing a typical multiple choice. Also, final projects are, um, again, a great way, a great alternative assessment that you can look at versus just the typical multiple choice exam. OK, um, so I'll be talking about my natural science experience. Um, so kind of like what Jenna said, the natural science are very content heavy um, and it's very like lots of lots and lots of information where you need to memorize it um, and be able to uh, tell it again. Um, so one way I found to um, to deliver your course um, is to have the flipped classroom. Um, instead of having most of your synchronous lecture be based on just giving out lecture and going through your PowerPoint. Um, that could be kind of long and students, um, especially with uh, screen fatigue, that could be a big issue for them uh, sitting through a lecture on their laptop for an hour and a half, let's say. 
Um, so a good alternative is to have a flipped classroom. So you can have asynchronous micro lectures. So we usually recommend like seven to 10 minutes um, of just topic-based lectures. And in your Moodle course, um, you can break it down by topic instead of week. Um, and you can just have a good landing page where it's very organized. Um, and you can also include like activity completion features, um, which will track students' progress. So if um, they can go and check like which lectures they've um, they've attended, and then just keep uh, just keep themselves on track. Um, and then in addition to that, you can have classroom activities where they further develop their knowledge, and that's where um, they will be doing like problem based. Uh, questions and working with groups and um, basically learning from each other, um, but also uh, asking the professor um, some questions. Um, and another thing, another tip is rethinking summative assessments. Um, Jenna did touch on this, but um, I would like to touch further on it. So for example, high impact practices, um, having semester, oh, I apologize for the noise in the background. Um, so having semester long projects and case studies is a great way to build student bonds and also to have students engaged throughout the semester um, rather than having like a big final exam or a big midterm and a big final. Um, semester long projects will allow them to come back to it and add, um, add to their project as they're gaining more knowledge. Um, and that's just a high impact practice, practice meaning that um, it will allow students to retain the information better um, rather than just, you know, the final exam, memorizing everything a couple of days before and then just forgetting that. Um, and another uh, high impact practice is low stakes assignments. Um, for example, having monthly quizzes for comprehension um, is a great way to have students constantly engaged in their learning. Um, and you can also add the activity completion features, like I mentioned before, on Moodle. Um, and also uh, for the asynchronous micro lectures, you can add quizzes, you can embed video quizzes within the micro lecture. Um, so you could use on Bishops has a platform called Ensemble, um, and that's basically like Bishops, YouTube, and I'm sure other Maple Leaf universities use that too. Um, so you can have the video um, video quiz option and you can embed that within your Moodle. Or you can use the H5P option, which allows the, the questions to pop up right on the screen. And the benefit to that is um, just to keep students engaged throughout the micro lecture. Um, and they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be graded, so it could just be um, solidifying the knowledge that they just heard. So for example, um, the lecturer will say a sentence that is very factual and then you can have a multiple choice question pop up on the screen right after saying um, this is the correct answer um, and then the student would answer which, which one is the correct answer and it would just solidify that information further. Um, and yeah, there are multiple, also having case studies um, uh, incorporated um, throughout the semester is nice. Um, also, I'd like to talk about an anonymous place for constructive feedback. Um, going into the fall semester, it's a new challenge for everybody, so faculty and students alike. Um, and usually we have course evaluations at the end, um, at the end of the course, and that's not really helpful for the professor because the course is already finished and students don't um, don't really go into it to benefit the professor. They just go into it to like fill out a form. Okay, I have to check this out and then, okay, I need to, I need to leave early. Um, so let me just do this quick. And they don't spend time on the constructive feedback um, section, which is the most helpful section for professors. Um, so what we usually recommend is implementing a feedback feature, uh, an anonymous feedback feature on Moodle. Um, and that's really easy to implement. You just add an activity and it's just called feedback. And in that you can um, have a description and you can say, you can even add questions um, just to guide them as a prompt. 
So for example, we have questions saying like, are you actively learning? Um, how can I better my delivery of this course? Um, any other comments, things like that. And it's just nice for, um, and you can also include something about having uh, like how to have constructive feedback, how to give constructive feedback. So we also include that. Um, and that's just helpful for the professor because some students um, don't feel comfortable speaking up or going to the office hours to voice their concerns. Um, so having that anonymous place for constructive feedback is beneficial and it will help the professor um, just tweak their course um, to better the students. And lastly, we have gradebook setup, which Jenna also talked about. Um, so it's important letting the students know where they are in, um, uh, in, their, in their grades, um, especially since it's online. Um, students can't just come up to you at the end of, the, uh, at the, end of uh, the lecture and ask like, oh, how am I doing? What grade did I receive on this project? And things like that. Um, I know in the winter semester, when everything went online. Um, some of my courses, I did not know the grade until the final grades came out. Um, and I emailed my professor asking um, what grade I got. They would just say I passed and I wasn't able to see my grades, which was kind of frustrating and also um, anxiety. Like it just gave me anxiety um, not knowing what I got on my projects. So having that grade book set up is, um, is important. And also with Moodle, um, you can have, you can set up your assignments so that it will be a group submission. So only one person could submit in a whole group and that's just adding, um, uh, adding groups and then playing around with the settings. Um, so there's lots of features and little quirks of Moodle um, to also help the professor in terms of receiving these assignments. Um, and one last tip is we usually ask uh, professors to only accept PDF format uh, when they're accepting assignments, just so that they can, because um, some students, they just use weird applications and then the professor can't download it properly and things like that. Um, so just having a PDF uh, is good. And you can also um, annotate it right on Moodle and send the feedback uh, right away. Um, and I think that's all the tips I have for today. All right, thank you, Salma. So for the humanities team, uh, I have the, what I'm gonna be presenting is quite different than the business and natural sciences group. So I'll just get started. So throughout this process, my team uh, working with humanities faculty, it's felt as though online course design has been bringing us together while we've been apart. And so as when we're taking a substantial role in this year's course design, it gave us a kind of hope in isolation. So what we're doing is we're designing courses to take into consideration the loneliness of isolation and the fear of times to come, whether it's this semester or winter 2021. So using synchronous FaceTime and then a mix of synchronous and asynchronous course activities, we've noticed in the humanities division that it brings the human connection and support to students who are studying at home, but also to the faculty who may be teaching from home as well. And we've noticed that with different faculty members, there seems to be a stronger need and preference for student engagement when it comes to the online space. And so this could be due to the fear of students just having no input during an online call, camera was off, the mic was off, or just them not having any interest simply because it's online. And so in my team's experience, working in partnership with these humanities professors, we've decided to aim to prioritize content and class time because many humanities courses are in fact discussion-based. And so what we have tried to encourage our faculty to do, and if they don't, it is completely up to them, but we just find that it would be important to make available the foundational lecture material as quickly as possible in order to prioritize synchronous class time discussion or the Q&A periods. So this material that would be made for online delivery is going to be online for posterity and would require very little modification with each iteration of the course in however many other semesters they'll be using this exact format. And so for example, we've had faculty who have choose, chosen to 
record the entirety of their course via podcasts. So other faculty members are choosing also to record micro lectures of five to 10 minutes in length for their entire course. So now this material is fully accessible to the students and it's a resource that the professor would always have. And so once all the students can watch or listen to this content, we can prioritize having in-class, not in-class, sorry, but online synchronous discussions on Teams or Zoom or whatever program you're using. And you can engage in a more intellectual conversation with your students that feels like as close to in-person as possible. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to all courses. We had some special cases where it's been in the music department or it's been a shop class and it renders the process a little more complicated simply due to the content of the course itself and the fact that there is actual applicable practice to what is being taught. But we continue to recommend that face-to-face, -face, whether it's simply in office hours, because in humanities, it's all just, it's discussion-based for the most part. You can discuss music when you're practicing. You can discuss virtually everything. So it just alleviates the sense that students won't feel supported in the coming semester. So we feel that the face-to-face -face is one of the key points that we should try to implement in this process. And so in general, what we in humanities have been trying to project is that asynchronous material and synchronous face time should go hand in hand. They should flow easily into one another. And in the online setting, we hope that in time, one cannot even exist without the other. I've heard stories of universities from out west where I am currently that they're only doing asynchronous material. And I'm worried for those students simply because they won't have any connection with their fellow classmates. They won't have any connection with their faculty. And so just having this flow of synchronous face time and asynchronous material just assures that engagement will be thorough in the humanities faculty and that there won't be any worry for the fall semester. And another thing kind of leading back to what our process is as OLTCs, a question that we have in the needs assessment is, what is the craziest thing you would want in your online setting or for your course? And looking at that question in the humanities uh, division, it seems as though we could easily transfer their craziest idea and make it so that the students will receive it in a very engaged way and that it impacts their learning just as much as it would impact the faculty's experience of teaching. For example, the idea of having a field trip right now, it seems like it's out the window because of the current stance of where we are, but you could, how, you could host a virtual tour of the location that you are wanting to do the field trip at. Or you could just even implement the background of your Microsoft Teams call as a different location. If you're talking about Greece, make your background a Greek coastal city or something like that. It's just you're, the craziest idea that you could have in your online setting, if you pr make it in a way that you know the students will be receiving it in a positive fashion, it will just even engage them into discussion even more and make them be more excited to take on the topics that you are wanting to teach them. And so that's the spiel that I have for the humanities group. I believe it's the education faculty now. Yeah, so um, I'm part of the education student working group. Um, shout out to them. They've been actually, we've worked really well all summer together. Um, our experience has been uh, similar to humanities, but a little different in the sense that we're actually um, have to look through a critical lens when it comes to education as a whole, because that's what we're studying. Um, so our overarching theme is really based on discussion, um, collaboration, critical pedagogy, and personal experience. We use our experience as students to help shape how we as educators would like to teach. Um, so we really want opportunities for this discussion and collaboration in order um, for students to be really engaged and to get the best experience that they can therefore transfer on um, in their future teaching practice. So things that we've done um, with this is we've done a lot of professors have actually really liked the idea of perusal, which I mentioned before, where you put articles on and everyone kind of collaborates and comments. 
and all of that. And um, it's a really nice way to read because maybe if you're not understanding something and someone else doesn't understand or someone has a different perspective as you, it kind of um, opens up the avenue for the possibility of discussion and um, collaboration as well. So there's another thing that we've worked on and discovered this summer. It's not new, but Flipgrid is another really good platform that we've been using and recommending to a lot of our professors because it really allows you to kind of film yourself responding to a prompt or to a question, a video, anything. It, there's a vast array of possibility for it. And um, the discussions, the video discussions can go on from, I think, 10 seconds to 10 minutes. And in that case, you can kind of explain your view on something without necessarily having to write it. Sometimes verbalizing it is a lot easier than um, writing it down. And it also changes, changes things up a little bit. Um, our primary focus when it comes to this course design is really synchronous modes of instruction with kind of asynchronous activities on the side, but not so much. So um, the learning really happens in real time through this discussion, through collaboration. It's not the professor who's telling the students what to do. It's more everyone coming together and kind of bouncing ideas off of one another and coming to a conclusion from there. Um, we want to recreate kind of the in-person experience because a lot, of, a lot of us are being trained to teach. Um, and if we're online being taught how to teach, how do we go in and teach in person? So that's... Um, kind of the thing that we've been working with throughout this whole summer. Um, we really don't want to take away from the online experience as well. We kind of want to showcase all the great parts um, that online experience and online education can bring. It's not, um, it doesn't replace the in-person experience, but there are ways to um, help emulate that experience. Um, and when it comes to differentiation, we really want to focus on divergent forms of assessment. So education really isn't the education program isn't really based on um, these kind of final exams, these high stakes testing um, quizzes. It's really more focused on um, discussions, critical reflections, um, uh, like I said, but also presentations, right? So how do we take like things that we would normally do like conferences in one course we're working on, it, that's it, there's a big conference at the end. How do you emulate that in an online setting without taking away from that whole experience? So we really want to be able to do these types of assessments that allow uh, people to have diverse opinions and that's the most important aspect of it all. And when it comes to future implications, we really need to focus on um, thinking about the implications of teaching and training these future, future educators, right? Um, how do we model critical pedagogy? How do we, um, the big dilemma at this point is if there is a second wave, like we were saying, um, and everything is locked down, how do we prepare like the education students to teach in their practicums fully online? So that's something that we've also been dabbling with um, in all of that. And a lot of our professors have changed their view from teaching to teach, um, to teaching how to teach online um, so that we feel more prepared going into this practice ourselves um, in the near future. So that's pretty much all I have for, for education. Um, and I'll hand it over uh, to Sophia for social sciences. Thanks, Amanda. Um, as some of you may know, the social sciences covers a wide variety of subjects from psychology to economics, poli sci, et cetera. And as students and advocators for mental health, the social sciences team understands how important it is to protect our well being. So we work to create an inclusive and accommodating environment for all students and professors. So the social sciences team does this by encouraging professors to create a safe and brave space in the classroom uh, in discussion and encouraging professors to take into account their students' um, time zones, their learning situations. So for example, do the students need to share a computer at home? And if so, uh, when do they have access? just to accommodate to their needs, and finding ways to make online learning less stressful for both the student and professor. Um, we are also working closely with professors to try to conserve the classroom. So by helping professors include discussion opportunities for their students, the students have a chance to have their hallway chats as they normally would. And in addition to that, we help create means of class discussion or interactive lectures to preserve the connection between students and their professors. That is one concern that has come up time and time again uh, with professors is that engagement and communication and just that connection with the students and the students between each other. So that's one thing that we really wanna preserve. Um, 
The last point I want to share about the social sciences team is how we provide a multidisciplinary input. Each group member of the team comes from a different academic background. You might wonder, how does this help student-centered learning? Well, since each group member is in a different stage of their education, and we're all working towards different degrees, we provide the various student perspectives that can help the professors build their courses. Uh, we bring the perspective of a first year entering their, la uh, their second year, a fourth year entering their final year at Bishops. We have a grad student entering the workforce and a grad student uh, moving on to a master's program. So working together with all of our experiences, the social sciences team uh, knows what works and what doesn't and what will work well for the students, which through course design will help students in the fall 2020 semester. So that's sort of a little look into what the social sciences team has been up to and what we've been working on. So we thought maybe uh, to sum up um, practice in this online environment, we wanted to provide you with the list of do's and don'ts for both professors and students. So um, in terms of professors, in, and to do is to establish a safe and brave space, which Sophia did bring up before. So by safe and brave space, um, we just want you to take into consideration that students will be stressed, frustrated, and anxious. So the classroom, office hours, and all of the resources available will be their guide to a successful semester. So by making that brave space in the classroom, they'll be more likely to come out of their shell and talk during live lectures, et cetera. Um, and that kind of brings us on to the next point, which is encouraging students to turn their cameras on to engage during class time versus on the don't side, requiring them to turn on their microphones and cameras. So students will have a lot going on in their lives, especially being at home, which is a new type of learning environment for them. So um, they may have younger siblings or dogs barking in the background, et cetera. So encouraging them to turn on their cameras when they feel comfortable um, will just uh, goes more into creating that brave space versus requiring them to turn them on. Um, next on the do's list, we have giving students realistic timelines. So there are plenty of new features on Moodle and Teams that make it easy to want to do so many projects and group assignments and homeworks and quizzes with students. But um, adding up all of these assignments will stress students out, especially if they are taking a normal workload of four to six full time for classes. Um, and that's why we move on to the don'ts list where it says do not have an abundance of assignments and reading. So rather than doing that, we should be focusing on the quality versus the quantity of the content. Um, and lastly, on the do side, we have keep an eye on chat feature during live lectures or appoint a chat monitor. So Teams, Zoom and BlueJeans, all three of those platforms have a chat feature on the right hand side especially in large lectures while you're presenting. Um, it's, it's a great way for students to really connect with each other and discuss course content while you are lecturing. So keeping an eye out for any questions or good discussion points that may come up in the virtual chat room um, will help you see where students are at and um, continue the discussion as well. But again, um, maybe appointing a chat monitor um, within your class, will that can kind of wave you down if there is a question, might be a more effective way of doing so. Um, and then lastly, overall, on the don'ts list, we say um, try to avoid cold calling in live lectures. So cold calling is the practice of just randomly picking a student who may or may not have their camera and microphone on to answer a question. So although this may be a way to test if they're listening, um, for example, if they do have um, dogs barking in the background or, or a baby crying in the background and they turn on their microphone, it really distracts the class from the whole lecture and um, it's just not an efficient way of um, getting a question answered. So maybe focusing more on the students that are willing and excited to raise their hands and share their screens might be a better way of going about this. So I'm going to pass it on to the do's and don'ts for students. Hello, I'm just going to
quickly go through the do's and don'ts for students. So first of all, uh, in the do list, the first one is to try and set up a designated work area. This is really important for the quality of your learning because it's difficult to work in a space that is just, but I mean, people have to work with what they have, but it's important if they can to set up a designated work area for them to go to do their schoolwork. Uh, the next one is establish a routine. This can be very helpful for people, especially because the pandemic has kind of thrown people a lot of, thrown them out of their routine. So establishing a quick routine in the morning to get themselves ready can help with motivation. Uh, the next one is prioritizing healthy habits. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's good to be healthy and sitting in front of a computer all day is not ideal. So getting up, taking those bio breaks, stretches, go for walks can really help students in the long run. Uh, the next one is engaging with students outside of class time. So this would be informal chat opportunities. This kind of relates to what I talked to before about preserving that hallway chat. Having that time to have the connection with your students can be helpful, especially uh, you know, a lot of uh, what was mentioned before, there's a lot of group discussion work. There's a lot of collaborative work in the various programs. So it's important to have these connections outside of the classroom as well, which will make learning better um, on the go. The next one is to be accountable for your learning. It's important for students to keep in mind that it is not the teacher's complete and entire responsibility for their learning. It is up to the student to make sure that they are getting things done on time, that they're taking, um, time for themselves so that they have the mental ability and capacity to really focus on their work. So students just need to take care of that. Uh, next, I'll start with the don't list. So the first one is, again, don't procrastinate. It's never a good idea to leave things to the last minute, especially in such unpredictable times. It's never a good idea. Uh, the next one is don't be afraid to reach out for help. This is very important and this also kind of relates to creating this the safe and brave space so the more comfortable your students feel the more likely they will be to reach out when there's problems and then things won't snowball into a big disaster at the end of the semester so encouraging your students to feel comfortable uh, to ask questions to reach out for whatever they need is always much better um, we don't want students to be late I've got the dogs barking just like jenna mentioned this is a real thing, it happens. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we don't want students to be late. It should be treated like an in-person uh, person session. It's just consideration for the rest of the students and for the professor, and just helps make online learning go a lot smoother. And last but not least, uh, don't be insensitive towards your professor and peers. Everyone is trying their best. Yes, everyone is going through this in their own way and form. So it is important that we take care of each other, we take care of ourselves, and we make sure that everyone is having the ability to do the best they can in this situation. Sorry, it's not letting me change. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> and the last slide that we have for our presentation here is just a few resources that we have on our website. So these are just for students and also for faculty if you want to put these onto your Moodle pages. We have blog posts that have different topics for students and faculty. We have an example for a land acknowledgement, an example for a statement on academic integrity, and an etiquette statement. And we also have a video and a list for the top 10 high impact Moodle features to increase student engagement. Um, so yeah, uh, that's all that we have for our presentation and we'll just go into our question and answer panel.